So in our last video, we talked about the crimes of impulse, these explosive situations where an act of violence occurs because of a love triangle and jealousy or because of just fury and rage. They're in some sort of situation that triggers something in them to do something way out of the ordinary for the persona that they have. These would be your people next door, your friend down the street. You would typically in an interview hear, I can't believe that this person did that. Or there's no way that I would ever think that they would be capable of such an act. Another aspect of the impulsive crimes could be mental illness. They could be suffering from some sort of schizophrenia, or they could be using illicit drugs that cause them to do something they would normally not do if they had been following a treatment plan or had been in a state of sobriety at the time that they did it. So they might not necessarily be responsible for the crime that they had committed because of the mental illness taking over. But these next group of people, well, they're still in the same situation. They're still not career criminals. They're not killing multiple people in a spree or they're not serial killers doing it over time. These are still one-timers. They do this, they kill their victim, and then it's over. They don't keep on going. They don't plan these things out. These are spur the moment, gruesome acts of violence. However, the antisocial characteristics that go along with the crimes that they committed can be attributed to the victim that was, that was chosen. It could be a small child or a pregnant woman. It could be just some sort of excessive, over-the-top, gruesome type of violence that the other crimes didn't have. And another aspect of the antisocial traits that these next cases have that the other cases did not necessarily have is quite a bit of malice afterthought. While these are impulsive crimes, they didn't have any premeditation, they didn't have malice of forethought, but it's like they woke up in the middle of what they were doing and realized, hey, I'm going to get in a whole lot of trouble for this. This is going to change the rest of my life. I need to cover this up. I need to do something to escape justice. These are signs of an antisocial type of personality that the other crimes just were lacking. They did not have. Before we begin, what is antisocial? What does that word mean? Let's define that so that as we review these cases, we can reflect on why we would put them into this category rather than with the rest of the impulsive type murders. What makes these ones different from just your love triangle, I caught you two in bed and now I'm going to kill you kind of murder. So. Antisocial can mean a couple of things. This is somebody that is like standoffish, they're shy, they're not an extrovert, they're extremely introverted people, they don't want to interact with others in their peer group like most people usually would. But antisocial is also a personality disorder that's diagnosed through the DSM-5. Sometimes it's called sociopathy. It's a mental disorder in which a person consistently shows no regard for right and wrong. They ignore the rights and feelings of others. They are pathological liars. They don't care if they tread on the rights of others as long as they are getting the goal that they want. Um, it's kind of an absence of feeling. So these people are not true sociopaths. They are not diagnosed with an antisocial personality disorder, but the crimes that they committed have traits that are somewhere between being an antisocial type of person 
to where you're standoffish, you're, you're shy, you don't want to talk to anybody, you don't want to contribute to society, and having this antisocial personality disorder. They're in the middle. They have some traits that make them lean towards the sociopathy side of the scale. We will begin with the case of Jean-Claude Romain. He's in France, in the Lyon area. He's in this category, not just because of the gruesomeness of his crime, the closeness of the people and how many of them there were, but from the life that he led before, the events leading up to it, his personality traits and the way that he dealt with other people. It started when he was when he was young, when he was in grade school, he would lie about grades that he was getting in school or if he got a bad mark on an exam, then he would lie to his parents so he didn't have to hurt them in any way. And that type of behavior he started to get away with and it carried on into college, into adulthood. Now somehow he got into medical school, even with how poorly he did in secondary school. And he kept on failing. He actually failed his third year exams 10 years in a row. But he convinced the deans to allow him to stay in medical school because of some sort of extravagant story that he would tell them, a con that he would give them. He actually told them that he had come down with cancer and that is the reason why he was unable to study and failed the exam. And every time it would be a different story until they finally kicked him out. Well, he had already met somebody and got married to her, had two kids, he could not face his parents and his wife and tell them that he failed out of medical school. So he made up this top secret job that he had across the border in Geneva. And he's working with the World Health Organization as some sort of medical advisor to important people. But he couldn't talk about it and we couldn't call because it is just too important and too top secret of a job. So instead of going to work, he would go and he would read articles in his car or he would go to a coffee shop and read a book, keep apprised of the latest in medicine. So if conversation came up that he would sound intelligent and know what he was talking about. So his parents and his in-laws believed that he was extremely intelligent. He seemed like a doctor. He had gone to med school. They kept on giving him money because of his intelligence to go and invest for them. It's all of their retirement, their life savings. They just keep on giving to this guy in the belief that he's putting it into some sort of mutual fund or or the stock market or something where they're going to get dividends and grow a nest egg for their family. Well, that's not what he was doing. He was using the money that they were giving him in order just to live off of. And this was going okay. It was sustainable for a little while until he met the woman in Paris. And they started an explosive affair together. They were going to run away together. He convinced her that he was a, re a really good person with money and he could invest it for her. She had just uh, sold a property for 900,000 francs. And he convinced her to let him invest it on her behalf. So he took her money and he began to buy her things as the hopeless romantic. And he thought this was all right, that this is what he was supposed to do. He bought her a Mercedes in order to keep her happy. Of course, he's doing it with her money. And you can only do this for so long before the money runs out. And that's what happens. He goes broke and she confronts him. They have a fight. He runs back to his house. Um, his father-in-law was there and he's figured out that this guy has gone broke too and he demands his money back. So he pushes him down the stairs 
and he dies. He kills him. He's an old man when he does this. So then, the crime already being done, murder had happened. He shoots his two children and his wife. Then he goes to his parents' house and he shoots both of them. He kills his entire family, his immediate nuclear family of him, his, his wife, his two children, and then he kills his father-in-law and he kills both of his parents. Um, he finally snaps out of it and has this malice afterthought, I need to cover up this crime. The best way to do that is to torch the house. He lights the house on fire. He swallows a bunch of sleeping pills that were past their expiration date. Um, he does pass out in the house while the fire is going, but firefighters rescue him. They're able to pump his stomach and he gets consummate life sentences to which he is still serving today. But he's in this category because he is the charming con man. He is the person that everybody loves and will trust with money. He would never do wrong. This is the, the smiling debonair person on the soap opera that is just has this perfect life that they've painted for everybody to see. But the reality of it is much, much different. So as far as the seven deadly sins are concerned, he touches on pretty much every one of them throughout the life and crime that he commits. So this next case is not a murder at all, but the level of evil that it reaches it is right there with the things we're talking about in these categories. Now when capital punishment is the sentence in a trial, it's usually reserved for premeditated murder, extremely horrific crimes, um, treason. But one of the crimes that reaches the level of jurisprudence where the death penalty can be applied is kidnapping. We don't see many other cases reaching that level of a sentence. But not all kidnappings are impulsive. In fact, most of them have an extreme amount of premeditation. A, a lot of planning goes into kidnapping somebody. The main motive for a kidnapping is greed. It's the theme of every movie from the 1990s. You kidnap a wealthy person's family member. You hold them for ransom until they pay a certain amount of money and then you drop them off somewhere. Um, the next motive is a slavery or sexual type of motive, a human trafficking kind of situation. But these crimes, even though the victim may be a victim of opportunity, the crime itself has extreme measures of planning that went into it to the point where there could be an entire infrastructure that's in place to deal with the victims of the crime once the opportunity presents itself. So that's an extreme example of premeditation. Rarely you'll hear about the baby snatchers, these older women that go into menopause and um, they're lonely, they feel like something's missing out of their life, then one day they're in the grocery store, the opportunity presents themselves, they see a shopping cart where the mother isn't paying attention to the infant child, she grabs the child and takes off out of the store with it. That's a very rare crime and it seems like it would be impulsive, but she has been thinking of doing this for a very, very long time. It's just the opportunity finally presented itself and she took advantage of it. Now our case, the Eric Nielsen case, may have a more understandable motive. Understandable is a word I'll use for lack of a better one, but there's a custody battle going on and custody battles get brutal, they're nasty, there's mudslinging. 
people's feelings get hurt, they're depressed, people have committed suicide over custody battles. And so it's the day before the mother is going to be granted the custodianship in the case of their two-year-old daughter Genevieve. And it's Mother's Day, but Eric Nielsen gets an overnight visit that night with his daughter, and he's just not coming back. He decides, well, if I have to do this, I'm out. So he picked her up for this visit, and he took off. He ran to California. He changed his name, and he changed Genevieve's name. Um, it's thought that he had the help of some family members in California, but that's just speculation based on the circumstances of, of how he pulled off what he did. He began to work under the table. That means he's not using his social security number to file any tax returns or working in a legitimate type of atmosphere. Um, he's doing construction jobs, probably agricultural jobs, gig work that you can do. They're not going to be reporting it to the Social Security Administration so they won't find you. This entire time, he's telling his daughter that it, her mother had died in a car accident and that's why she wasn't around and why she didn't have a mother then later after she graduated from high school they moved to Arizona where Eric got in trouble for something and he was serving some time in prison for crimes that he had committed well some good detective work turned up the truth of what had happened and Genevieve was reunited with her mother on Mother's Day again 29 years after the crime had been committed. This case is it's a monument to selfishness that is for sure uh, to be able to deny a relationship for two people um, the mother I can't imagine the anguish that she went through for 29 years grieving the loss of a child that was still alive and being completely evicted from her life and not being able to experience any of her childhood or adolescence growing up. It's, it's a very long time to be separated from somebody. And then on the girl's part, it's just baffling to think that one day her entire life is revealed to be a, an extreme lie. Everything that she had known, her entire identity is not even true. She realizes her father is a liar and a scoundrel and an extremely evil person, that her mother hadn't died and she'd been robbed of that relationship. And who she believed that she was this entire time is not even a reality. It's the thing that, that, that books and stories are written about. The next case we're going to look at has some parallels with the previous one, but of course it's different. Norman Harrell is going to be our perpetrator and he killed Diana Hawkins his lover and his wife, mother of his child. But both of these people had relationships with other people before. Diane had six kids from four different fathers and Norman had the same kind of a situation going on. He had at least one child that he was having his wages garnished for for child support. He'd end up in divorce court before and he was finding himself in this same kind of situation now he already had a history of of criminal activity he had a long rap sheet from when he was younger he had two separate armed robberies that he was convicted of and a rape allegation that was later dropped he was a large man, he was 6'5", he was very jealous and possessive, and he was abusive. Um, women left him because of that. That's why he was going through the divorces that he had been going through. 
He, like I said, he had several children with several different women and forced to pay child support. And that can make somebody very resentful and very bitter and very angry. He had a son with Diane Hawkins. Um, she had six kids from four different men, including her son. So five of these children he was a stepfather to. Their relationship became extremely abusive and um, just kind of a gasoline on fire kind of relationship. So it ended and they were going to go to court and the day before they were supposed to go to court to argue for child support and custody and just have the hearing, he goes over to the house to supposedly negotiate with Diane and he's an avid hunter he uses knives all the time he's well versed in how to skin and butcher animals and he trusses diane like a deer he eviscerates her he slices her abdomen open and disembowels her takes all of her organs out and then removes her heart from the chest cavity and decides he's going to keep that well, in the middle of this going on, Diane's 12-year-old daughter, Katrina, woke up and was investigating the situation when he chased her upstairs and brutally murdered her in the same way. Um, he disemboweled her, eviscerated her, took her heart and threw it into the woods somewhere. They never found the little girl's heart. Um, he was eventually convicted by DNA evidence. Um, to this day, he denies any involvement. He got a life sentence for this crime. Um, the DA vigorously persecuted it because of the gruesomeness and just how gross the violence was in this case. But still, to this day, he claims innocence. That's part of the reason why he's in this category is all of the other impulsive crimes they eventually admitted to it or they gave a reason for it or tried to plea insanity or something of that nature not in Norman's case he says he never did this wasn't involved even with DNA evidence convicting him and showing him the blood splatter all of that came back to show without a without a doubt he's the one that did this but no he couldn't have been involved Now, there's some truth to these stories, these childhood stories of wicked stepmothers or wicked stepparents abusing children because it's not to put these women in a bad light. It's the truth of the matter of what happens. You are far more likely to be abused or to be sexually molested by a stepparent than you are by a parent that is your biological entity. It happens in nature as well. If a lion takes over a pride, it is very likely that it will kill the cubs of any other males that had come along. It seems to be a natural type of instinct. And when you get onto the very basic instinctual level of what people do in the time of anger, some of these things these stereotypes come out to be truth and the Ziegler case is no exception this is the case of the wicked stepfather though now Kimberly and Mr. Ziegler his name is Royce they met on World of Warcraft they were playing video games online because that is the basis of a wonderful relationship but I digress. Kimberly was 17 years old. She had a two-year-old girl, Riley Ann Sawyer. And she's a little blue-eyed, blonde, beautiful baby girl down in Texas. And Royce gets together with Kimberly, becomes the stepfather, and he didn't like the way that this girl behaved. He felt that she needed discipline. He needed her to say yes sir, no sir, to do things like a drill sergeant 
running his troops instead of a parent trying to empathize with a child. So he needed, in his mind, to stay home and show Kimberly how to properly discipline this girl so she would start to behave in a manner that is acceptable for a child her age. So he began by whatever started the incident, beating her with a belt. And that left lacerations, cuts, welts, bruises all across this girl's body. Then when that wasn't working, when she kept crying and screaming and being annoying, he got a thicker, bigger belt and savagely beat her with that. After that was not working, he was not getting the results that he wanted. Um, she could not stop crying long enough to say yes sir or no sir. He filled the bathtub up with water and it's alleged that it's with the help of the mother. He would periodically hold her head under water until she almost passed out and then let her up. He was effectively waterboarding this two-year-old girl multiple times until he had finally had enough in a fit of rage he was not getting what he wanted he grabbed her hair and he lifted her up and swung her body like a projectile threw it against the wall smashing her skull and then it hit the tile floor and smashed it again broke her skull in several places and she was just at that point dead so this is when the level of planning had to become accelerated very quickly her body is going to be found by a fisherman but rather not her body it's going to be like a tote or an ice chest some sort of a storage container that was floating with a bag inside of it and inside that bag is the mutilated body of the little girl so they had cleaned up the crime scene made it so that uh, they had to break bones and cut her in order to get her into this bag and into this this ice chest container tote kind of thing rubbermaid container and they took her down to the beach and threw her into galveston bay she floated for a while and washed up on shore um, after the fisherman found her, he reported it to the authorities. They called this um, little girl, this unidentified victim, Baby Grace. And it was the grandmother that finally identified the sketch artist rendering of what the girl would look like because she hadn't seen her, her granddaughter for a couple months. And this thing on the news, this picture looks just like her. And it turned out to be her um, Royce at the trial made a grandiose standing of how he wanted to take full responsibility for everything that his wife Kim had absolutely nothing to do with the evils that he had committed. This next case is a unique type of crime because it is done exclusively by women. Now having women be the, the perpetrator of a crime doesn't make it any more evil. What makes it more evil is the particular victim that these crimes happen to. Now, this crime is the story of Darcy Pierce. She kidnapped Cindy Ray from Kirtland Air Force Base. Cindy was eight months pregnant at the time and Darcy got her into her car and took her to the East Mountains of Albuquerque into a secluded place where they could not be found. It was out in the middle of nowhere. She then used her car keys to perform a c-section. She cut open her stomach and took the fetus out and it's an act of kidnapping. She's murdering the near-term pregnant mother in order to kidnap the baby from out of her body. Cindy Ray, she died, but the baby 
somehow miraculously survived. They ended up at the hospital. She was arrested from the hospital and she tried to plead insanity, but it turns out that she only did this crime because she wanted to have the baby. Now, the fact that there's several crimes here, there's a kidnapping, there's a murder with a kidnapping after it that is also an attempted murder. Usually the baby dies when this happens, but the, the baby's a person and alive, and it's a crime against their freedom to live and be happy as well. So where would you categorize this type of crime on our evil gradient scale? So that does it for our crimes of impulse by the antisocial. I hope that you've caught the distinction between these cases and the ones that we talked about in the previous video, the element of malice afterthought, the covering up the crime, or having some of these traits that we would attribute to some of the more horrific murderers, um, like charm, or that um, con man personality, or the victims that these particular people chose that made the killing more horrific or seemed to be a lot more evil in the eye of the jury and the eye of the public because as we know public opinion definitely counts towards whatever the sentence is going to be anyway next we are going to get into our premeditated murder and our psychopathic people that plot things and I will see you next time. Have a great day. Be good people and do good things.